Welcome everyone. This is the first edition of Fair Territory. It's sort of the little brother of Foul Territory. It's my own show. And why do I call it the little brother? Well, everybody knows, AJ Pruszynski reminds people constantly that I am shorter than most people. Okay? So let's call it the little brother for that reason alone. Now, you might ask, Ken, why are you even doing your own show, your weekly podcast? This is going to be a weekly YouTube thing as well. What's up with that? Well, if you remember, back in the day when I was on MLB Network, it wasn't that long ago. But back then, I would go on Hot Stove every morning during the offseason with Matt Fescursion and Harold Reynolds. And those two guys would repeatedly interrupt me. Harold would do it live, and Matt would do it through his soundboard where he had snippets of Harold saying different crazy things over the years. Now, doing foul territory with A.J. Pruszynski and Eric Kratz and Adam Jones and the whole gang, Todd Frazier... It's not quite as bad. But at the same time, AJ gives me heat from time to time. There's some harassment involved. I just wanted to do my own thing. So here we go. We're going to talk about a number of different topics every week. We're going to have a number of different segments. We're going to have a lot of fun. We'll do some interviews too from time to time. And we will involve you guys as well. Questions from time to time, just as I used to do on my podcast with The Athletic. So the first thing I want to discuss on this first show is related to the pitch clock. Now, most people, I think, would agree that the pitch clock is a hit, that the games are moving so much better, the pace, the times of games, everything that Major League Baseball wanted out of this thing, they're getting out of it. Now, I know there are some dissenters, some people who are cranky because some people are always cranky and don't like the clock and preferred it back when we had no clock and things just ambled along at the player's leisure. Well, in my opinion, I think in a lot of people's opinion, this is better. But there is one lingering question. There is one thing that has stuck with me ever since spring training when I interviewed Zach Wheeler for something I was doing for Fox Sports. And Zach Wheeler said to me, the at-bat with Harper in the NLCS, the at-bat Harper versus Robert Suarez, which led to, of course, the dramatic home run that decided the series, that at bat wouldn't have happened with the clock. And what Wheeler was talking about was the whole thing and the way that played out. The drama, the tension, the time it took between pitches, the time it took Harper to get to home plate, which would have been a violation. It's 30 seconds now. He took a lot longer than that. I think it was about 50 seconds. And I started to wonder, okay, is that a thing? Would some of the great postseason moments of the past, the Kirk Gibson homer, the Mets' great rally in 1986 in Game 6 of the World Series. Even the Mike Trout-Shohei Otani showdown in the WBC. How would they have played out in or under the current rules? It's a fair question. And you do wonder if we're going to lose a little bit of drama as we go along here. I kind of posed that question in the story. And I don't have an answer. But my sense of this is that there's no turning back, that we can't establish adjustments to the rules or we can't adjust the rules in a way where you'd have a clock, say, in close and late situations or in the ninth inning or simply in the postseason and no other time. Now, baseball has two separate rules or sets of rules for the postseason and the regular season. They do it with the extra inning rule, right? It doesn't even happen in the postseason. It's just in the regular season. And the extra inning rule, of course, is a situation where there are two sets of rules during a single game. Once a game goes to extra innings, if it does, the automatic rotor appears at second base, and here we go. That's not the case in the first nine innings. But that said, it doesn't seem to me that baseball wants to go backwards in any way. And I don't know that baseball should go backwards in any way. As much as I love those dramatic moments and the time it takes for those things to evolve. What we're talking about here is an entirely different way the game is presented. So to change it in the postseason, for example, well, you'd be going from games that may be lasting 2.45 to four hours again, or three hours and four hours again. That's at a time when you have the greatest number of eyeballs, the greatest number of people watching. They want to see the game presented as it's being presented now. You want to have kids being able to stay up until the conclusions of these games 
And you'll lose that right away again if you get rid of the clock in the postseason. So it's one of these things that will be discussed as the year goes on. And the commissioner, Rob Manfred, has said his feet are not set in stone with regard to the clock. They've already made some minor tweaks with it in the rule. But I don't know that this major tweak, a change in the late innings or a change in the postseason or both, is going to happen. And I don't know that it should happen. It's something we'll be watching as the year goes on. It's something quite interesting because you go back to the Kirk Gibson homer, that's one of my all-time favorite baseball moments. It took Kirk Gibson a minute 20 just to get the home plate because, of course, he was hobbled and he had all those physical issues with his legs. And that was part of the drama. Well, that wouldn't happen today. But I still believe great postseason moments will be great postseason moments even with the clock. They'll just be different, and we'll perceive them a little bit differently. That's all. Okay, that's how we start today. We're going to do something this week that we're going to do a lot on this show, too. We're going to bring in our one of our producers, Claudia Olson, and we're going to play a little game called Fair or Foul. Claudia's going to say something to me, and I'm going to say, Claudia, no, foul or fair, one way or the other. So, Claudia, let's get it started. Give me the first one. What do you got? All right, Ken. So, for the first Fair or foul today? Fair or foul. The Rangers are threats in the AL West. 2 0 season prediction to finish fourth. Fair or foul? Fair. Now, I don't know if threats is the right way to put it, but let's put it this way. They look like off their first series of the season, which is like 1% of the season, look like they're going to be more competitive. Now, I still have deep reservations about the ability of their starting pitchers to stay healthy. DeGrom, Haney, Evaldi, even John Gray, who was on the injured list three times last season. That is my biggest concern with this team. But the one thing I might have overlooked, and maybe some other people did too, Claudia, their offense is deeper than most fans probably think. Now, we all know about Seager and Simeon, but Adolis Garcia, 25-25 guy last year. Josh Young, this is a prospect who was injured for a long time. He's taking over at third base. Finally, he is going to be a part of this. Mitch Garver, who didn't play after the All-Star break last season, he's back and a force. And then Robbie Grossman, their lone free agent. Now, he's not a great player, but he looks like he might be an adequate person in left field. So with those guys, in addition to Seager and Semyon and everyone else, it starts to look like a more formidable group. And that's what we saw against the Phillies, especially in the first two games. They're going to pitch if they're healthy. We know that. But again, whether they contend or not, Claudia, that's going to depend on that rotation and its ability to stay upright. But their offense is good. They had some defensive replacements last night that were kind of interesting and impressive. It changed the game a little bit for them. So I sort of like them. And don't forget, if they are relatively healthy in the rotation, they've got one of the best managers of all time handling pitching in Bruce Bochy. It'll definitely be fun to watch them all season, that's for sure. Definitely staying tuned. All right, second option, fair or foul, is it already time to panic in Detroit? Fair. <laughs> panic is a little bit of a strong word, but concern is the right word. And here's a team that was the worst offensive team in the majors last season. They go out this offseason, they don't sign a free agent hitter to a major league contract. Not one. A couple of pitchers, but no hitters to major league contracts. They make a trade for Matt Veerling and Nick Maton from the Phillies, traded Gregory Soto for them. Okay, those are complimentary players. But they're basing their offense on the improvements of some of their young players, Spencer Torkelson and Riley Green. They're expecting Javier Baez to have a better year than he did last year in his first with the Tigers. And that's a lot to ask. Now, granted, the caveat here is they faced the Rays in this first series. And it was McClanahan and Eflin and Jeffrey Springs, who had a no-hitter through six innings yesterday. He was really good. He is really good. The Rays pitching is really good. So I don't know that I want to pass judgment on the Tigers based on one series against one of the top pitching teams in the majors. But I will ask, where is the offense going to come from? Is that improvement with some of the younger players actually going to take place? Is Javi going to come around? 
I don't know that we can count on it. So it's fair to be concerned about the Tigers, at least off their 0-3 start. Fair. I agree. Um, we'll use less harsh words this time. No panics or threats, but fair or foul, are the White Sox for real? Fair. But again, with a caveat. And I like the way they played against Houston. They went 2-2 two and two in that series, and they were – more than competitive. They played well for the most part. They had some bullpen issues in a couple of games, some runners on scoring position issues. We have to see how this plays out, but this is the story of their season. Are they fair or foul in terms of being real as a competitive type team? We know what happened before with La Russa, and we know there were problems galore, and that's why they brought in Pedro Grafal as a first-time manager, but someone that they believe in quite a bit. But this is put up or shut up time for the White Sox. And they keep telling us, and they've presented themselves as a team with a lot of talent. And they are a team with a lot of talent. At some point, you've got to show it. It's not the manager's fault anymore. So we shall see how this all plays out. But I was encouraged by the rotation over the weekend. You had to be. Cease, Lynn, Giolito, Clevenger all pitched fairly well. I'm encouraged by Moncada, especially, off to a flying start. The WBC helped him and Luis Robert Jr., forced him to get ready earlier, and it looks like, I know Robert started slowly, but he's off and running too now. So I like where they are. There are some defensive questions, no doubt, and bullpen without Liam Hendricks, of course. And granted, they also played an Astros team that was without Michael Brantley and Jose Altuve, and also without Jordan Alvarez in the last game. Bregman went 0 for 16 in the series. Okay, there are all these things, but the White Sox are missing Liam Hendricks. So... Yes, they are for real. They're in a weak division. They have no excuses. This is it for the White Sox. They've got to play at a higher level this season. I agree. And I'm sure the co-host of my show will also say the exact same thing when he will be <laughs> freaking out about the White Sox in no time. Um, that is all for me, Ken. I will say goodbye, and I will see you next week. Sounds good, Claudia. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. All right, one of the things we're going to do on the show is – Take a look inside maybe a story I've written or something I've experienced in my career. Go a little bit deeper from time to time. And one thing I want to do on this first show is to explain the story of the bow tie. Now, I'm not wearing it today. I only wear it on Fox. I don't particularly like wearing it for reasons I will explain. But it's something that's been obviously a part of my identity for some time now. And I often get asked by people, hey, what's up with that? Why are you wearing a bow tie. Why do you do that? People on Twitter know I wear them for charity and each one represents a different charitable organization. But the story of how it came to be, that's a little bit different. And it used to be that I could refer to an article I had on foxsports.com, but that article has disappeared into the ether somewhere. You can't find it anymore. So I'm going to explain it again for posterity now on our show. And actually, this goes all the way back to 2010. It was my fifth season with Fox, and David Hill, who was the head of Fox Sports, the man who invented Fox Sports, going back to 1996, a legend in sports broadcasting, and really someone who has been a force in this industry for quite some time. The word came from him, came from him up high. I want Ken in a bow tie. No, I had never worn a bow tie. I thought the whole idea was preposterous. This was for the playoffs in the 2010 NLCS. This is when this was all going down. And the idea that David had was to distinguish me visually with the bow tie, to make it look classy or to make me look classy in a way that was different than other reporters, to make me stand out. Now, the way I grew up in the business, the way to stand out was through your work. And my work was through written for the most part at that point, but also television as it went on. But I came to understand in later years, after this all got going, that there's more to it with television. You just don't necessarily rely on what you're saying and reporting. There is personality involved, and there is a look that can be involved too with certain people. Craig Sager, of course, was an outstanding example of that with his loud sport coats and all that, but they wanted to distinguish me in a classy way. So I didn't know how to tie a bow tie. 
And there was a guy I used to work at Fox named Jim Bernard who would tie them for me during the playoffs. And I remember after the first game, I wore it. And I remember saying also on the air when Joe Buck asked me about it, and he was always teasing me. I said I was playing the game under protest. My wife didn't like it. My kids didn't like it. And I didn't particularly like it either. But after that, I was approached by Eric Shanks, who is now the head of Fox Sports, and I guess then was maybe the number two. And I said to Eric, hey, do I have to do this again for this next game? I had just done it the night before. Do I have to do it again? <laughs> and Eric said, in so many words, that would be advisable. In other words, David Hill wanted me to keep doing it. So I get through the playoffs. Jim Bernard is tying my bow tie every single night. The people at Fox went out and bought me a few different ones. And then the playoffs ended, the World Series ends, and I'm like, whew, that's over. I don't ever have to deal with that again. Great. Well, a couple of weeks later, that offseason, 2010, 2011 offseason, I get a call from Dahani Jones, former NFL linebacker, guy who has this nonprofit called the Bowtie Cause. And what the Bowtie Cause does is partner with different organizations and represent them with bow ties. They sell the bow ties, but Basically, the bow ties are to raise awareness for these different charities. And he asked me if I want to wear the bow ties for his organization, the ones that they put out there. And at first I thought, nah, I'm not into this. But then I thought about it some more and realized David Hill is going to want me to do this again. So I figured this was a way for me to at least take some control of it. And of course have it done for some good causes. That was the whole idea. So that's how it came about. And of course, David Hill was proven right. It did become a big part of my identity. It didn't detract from my work. People still see my work for what it is. They like it, they don't like it, whatever the case might be. But people now know me as the guy who wears the bow tie on Fox. And when I'm not wearing one out in public, people ask, hey, where's the bow tie? And the few times I've seen David since, and he's been gone from Fox for quite some time now. He's always teased me. He's an Australian native, and he's got that great accent. He's like, where's your bow tie? And I have to say, David, you were right. So the funny part is that while this has obviously become a thing, I'll let you in on a little secret. I still don't love the thing. And I don't love the look because as a guy who's a little shorter, in my short man's complex head, the long tie, the necktie, gives me a little bit more length visually. This is in my head. The bow tie uh, kind of makes me look short. But you know what? It's too late. Too late for me to complain. Too late for my wife to lodge any objections. Too late for my kids to say, Dad, you look ridiculous. It's part of my identity, and I'm proud of it, and I'm proud of all the organizations we've raised awareness for over the years. It's been a great thing. And... I've loved actually every minute of it. So that is the story of the bow tie. A long time ago, when I was living in Baltimore, I hosted a radio show. And we did something on the radio show, this goes back, I don't know, more than 20 years now, called The Dude and Dork of the Week. And it was pretty popular, people liked it. And it gave us a chance to praise someone on one hand and give someone a little heat on the other hand. So we're gonna revive it for this show. It's gonna be a weekly staple, I hope. And we're going to start this week with our dude and dork of the week. And we'll start with the dude. Dude always goes first. He gets the honor because he did something good. That dude this week is Trace Thompson. I don't know if you saw it, but he hit three home runs against the Diamondbacks on Saturday night. It was a three-homer game for Trace, who played for Great Britain in the WBC. And who has had a long, twisting, difficult career. Starting in 2018... He drifted through eight different organizations before rejoining the Dodgers, which of course is where he is now. He had injuries earlier in his career. He had some different things going on. He's 32 at this point. But he is always someone who has worked really hard and always someone who has been extremely popular with his teammates. And I remember Alex Wood telling me last year, I don't think you will ever meet a player or anyone who has anything bad to say about Trace. So... There's no telling where his season's going to go just yet. He's part of a center field sort of platoon with James Outman, who is also off to a good start. 
But Trace Thompson has come a long way. That was an amazing performance on Saturday night. Not many players hit three home runs in a single game. So he is our dude of the week. Dork of the week, a little bit of a different story here. Same area of the country, Los Angeles Angels. This incident took place in Oakland. I believe you know what I'm talking about. The Anthony Rendon with the fan incident. Now, we've only seen the video. We don't know the full story. Major League Baseball is investigating. Rendon got into it with a fan, took a swipe at him. Didn't look to be a terribly violent swipe, but he took a swipe. And he got into it. And it's not cool. Now, the last thing the Angels need as they try to right themselves this season in Shohei Otani's last potential season with them before becoming a free agent is any kind of distraction, unnecessary distraction. You're going to get distractions throughout the baseball season. That happens. This is an unnecessary distraction. Now, I get where Rendon's coming from. He said the fan called him a bitch. That's what we see on the video. Players get taunted all the time by fans, social media, in person, and I am sure it is a bit much. In fact, it should be a bit much for a lot of guys. But the problem is, it's part of the deal. And for the most part, they've got to take it. Now, there are situations where someone gets completely out of line and they don't have to take it. I'm not sure this qualifies. Maybe we'll learn something in the future that will show us that it does, but doesn't appear that way based on what we've seen. So, Anthony Rendon, you can't do that. You're our dork of the week because you did it. And if things come out later that somehow exonerate you, I will withdraw this little honor that you've received this week. All right, so that's our dude and dork of the week. Now, usually at this time of the show, what I'll do is talk about a little where I'll be next for Fox, but I'm actually off this Saturday. We don't have a game, or at least I don't have a game that I'm working. The following Saturday, I will be in San Diego. That will be Milwaukee at San Diego. And the Padres, as always, are a fascinating team, at least as always under Peter Seidler and A.J. Preller in recent times. You saw the Jay Cronenworth extension over the weekend, seven years, 80 million. And this is just the latest signing by the Padres, the latest big investment by a team that has, based on what you used for accounting, either the third or fourth largest payroll in the major leagues right now. Third or fourth, the San Diego Padres. And people continue to wonder, and I wonder too, how are they doing this? They've got four players now. Machado, Tatis, Bogarts, and Cronenworth signed through 2030. 2030 is a long time away. They've got, for 2029... Commitments of $113 million. $113 million already committed for 2029. Now, Peter Seiler, the owner, does not like this word, the word sustainability. He hates when it's brought up. He doesn't think it's fair. He's saying, I'm going to run my team as I'm going to run my team. We'll be fine. Don't you worry about us. Well, I'm sorry. With those kinds of commitments, with these players who are aging, people are going to wonder, if this sustainable? What will happen as these guys get older? You're investing in all this money in all of these guys. What's going to be the case with the San Diego Padres? What's going to happen? It's fair. And listen, that excitement in that town is something to behold right now. The excitement for the team. They have to cap their season tickets. The ballpark is electric. Almost every home game, it's, it's cool. Petco Park is alive, man. But at the same time, what happens if they don't win? What happens if it doesn't turn out the way they want it to? Now, if they do win, they make a ton of money and kind of all justifies the investments that they made. If they don't, and it's baseball, you never know what might happen. Who knows? Soto is the only one really of the major pieces, haters another one, that they don't have locked up long term. So they're going to be who they are for several years. And that's good. This is, these are quality players, great players in many cases. But people are going to wonder in the industry, outside the industry, how the heck this is happening and how the heck the Padres are going to keep themselves strong without currently a strong farm system and a situation where they're going to have to be spending a lot of money in a lot of players for a long time. So 
That will conclude the show. We've got one more thing I want to add before we go. And that is the idea that we're going to welcome some questions on this show. And we'll be reaching out shortly, probably on Twitter, to tell you how to ask questions and how to go forward with these kinds of things. We'll be answering them from time to time. We're going to have a lot of fun here. We're going to do a lot of different things. It's going to be a blast. And you know what? To go back to what I was saying earlier, it was really cool just to talk for all this time without Harold or Matt getting in the way. Thanks. We'll see you next week. Hey, BetMGM has an MLB Bet 10 Bucks win 200 bucks offer for all Fair Territory fans in four easy steps. Sign up and deposit at least $10 into your newly created account. Then download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android. Place a pregame money line wager of at least $10 on any MLB team at standard odds price. You will then receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. Just use the bonus code SPICYBALL200. S P I C Y B A L L 200. Always bet responsibly. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1 800 Gambler.